So it was nice to be out here with you today, Stanley, um, learning the process of sorghum making and the steps that it goes through. I'm happy to come out with MTTV and You'll see an episode of Elm, or from field to plate on an upcoming episode that we're actually going to use sorghum. We're going to do a sorghum glazed tenderloin and um, actually be using using sorghum the old fashioned way, the way it's made now, not in the factory or nothing like you all have seen in this episode. Um, I'm here with Stanley Franklin, which this is his farm and his um, where he makes his sorghum raises it here. Stanley, how long have you been raising sorghum? I have probably 25 years, I guess, at least. 20, I'd say at least 25 years. I don't know for sure, but I used to take it down to Wick Smith, if you knew who Wick Smith was. Yes, yeah, sure he, did. I used to haul it down to his place, and he made it down there. Uh, I used to haul some around here to Glen Whit, and Glen had a uh, mill and everything on around the road here for me. I, I took it to him for a while, and uh, I just got interested in it, and it's, you know, it's a lost art, nearly and been at it ever since. Not on a large scale, but enough to know how uh, hard it is to do. But, but you still make it way, I, I don't know over the old fashioned way, but you still make it a way. Yeah, that, uh, that well. You've always made it. Uh, I guess uh, people will tell you that it doesn't make any difference where you strip the leaves off of it or not. But I don't like to bring all that trash in around, you know, the, the mill. I always strip it, cut the heads off in the field, and bring it in on the way and clean. You can see how clean that yeah, is. Yeah, it looks there. really nice. Yeah. And uh, uh, so we look forward to seeing y'all on an upcoming episode. Um, it's been a nice to be with Stanley Day and um, see this process going on. And um, we thank y'all for tuning in. We thank um, Stanley letting us come to his farm be able to see this process as stanley said it's a dying art but it's a, it's a strong work county tradition and um, we're happy to be part of it today thank you stanley okay appreciate it all right thank you so when this is growing out field of course it's got a a, a head after they bloom out or yeah. whatever mm -hmm. like tobacco right they yeah. bloom out mm -hmm. so do you cut that off at the same time you strip it well, usually you will, but if you want it, you can go ahead and strip it. You know, there's a leaf at every joint. Right. And you cut that off. There's no use bringing that in because that's no value. Right. Then we go back and cut the heads of it off. The head would be about that long, you know, with little tiny seeds in it. You cut that with a knife, a yeah. pocket knife, just like top no, of the back? No, take or? a big uh, corn knife. Okay. Whack it off as a go. I've got some of them over there in the shed. Um, Sometimes you'll leave it standing with a head on it for a while, unless you're going to get to it real quick, you know. Yeah. And and then you'll go ahead and cut the head of it off. I don't have any of those heads up here. I'll show you what they look like. It's they're, kind of a big bloom, like, aren't they? Well, so they, yeah, they get, when they get real ripe, they're seeds, hard seeds. Okay. They're not much bigger than a BB. Okay. And they're starting to describe them. And, you, you know, cut the head off. The birds and the turkeys and the, everything like that likes them. Now, this might be a dumb question, but can so can you save those and get seed to plant back? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you could. Right. Yeah. A lot of people do. And they use their seed over and over and over. You know. Right. You'd have to dry those heads out and lay them up, and let them dry, and then shake them out. Or yeah. how would you do yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah. You'd uh, shake them out if you could, and make sure they're dry. Cause if they're not good and dry, they'll mold. I've had a lot of it to mold on me like it. Yeah. But they didn't yeah. get it dry as it should be. Now, you said uh, down there, maybe didn't hear it then, but uh, you planted this by hand? Yeah. Now, you mean just uh, take a, a carpenter's apron and fit and walk along yeah. and uh, you lay it off with a tractor and drop it in a row or is it in a heel or what's it in? Yeah, drop it in a row. Usually you just take your foot and step on it like that and drop it down there and, and kick a little dirt over it, not get too much dirt over it because if you do, it won't come up good. Uh, that's the way I did mine, is kick a little dirt over it, you know, enough for it to have a root take a hold. And uh, about three or four grains to the hill, not over six. And then how far apart and are about, the hills? Uh, Foot? But yeah, probably 14, 16 inches. 14 or 16 inches yeah. apart. Yeah. You ever have to go back and thin it out? Yeah, sometimes I've gotten it too thick. I have to go back and thin it. I guess you heard people having the thin corn years ago. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've helped thin corn before. Yeah, it's the same process. Yeah. 
course, uh, most time, unless you, that's that's a good time when you have to thin, and a lot of oh, people yeah. can't get thick enough. You yeah, know, that's come right. Up or, uh, yeah. Of course, I guess ideally, if it all come up, you plant one seed per hill. Oh, and just yeah. two or three, that's the reason you plant more than one. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> now, I noticed uh, they stuck a whole bunch through this, going over to the mill now. How much can you stick through that mill at one time? Well, you, you don't want to, about this many, six, eight stalks, and depending on the size of the stalk. Yeah. Stalks are real big, you couldn't put over three or four in it. Okay. These, these aren't real big here, and you put a pretty good handful in there now. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I looked around there and I heard the tractor pull down there just a little bit and there's a big wad of it coming out. Yeah. I guess uh, yeah. that gets pretty tight in there turning that, so yeah. it takes a, some power to turn it. Yeah. Now, the old timers, uh, of course, and you can go to the festival and watch it, they pull, pull them with a the mule, didn't they, yeah. instead of a tractor. Mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah. Yeah. Don't have to. Don't have to let your tractor rest in water, it, do you? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's all the same way, but you know, it's that big sweep on the the mill turns the same way. You know, something that this does. The PTO turns this, the mule turns the other. You know. Yeah. Around. Yeah. Where'd you? get this meal, Stanley. Have you had it a long time? No, I bought it from uh, James Sexton down in Dittany. Uh -huh. he, he quit uh, raising cane and he got, I guess that he wasn't able, and I bought his meal. And uh, that, you know, uh, tobacco buyout, you know, I took a portion of that money that I got from the tobacco buyout and they bought me a cane meal. Okay. I got the, the meal and the pan well, I didn't get, not that pan, another right. pan. And the uh, furnace and those paddles, all that stuff from James when he quit. Okay. He he had that mounted on a truck frame. You know, he could hook to it and haul it anywhere he wanted to. Of course, right. I, I just kept it stationary all the time I've had it. But James, was he was a ingenuity. He, he could do it. Anything needed to be made or done, he knew what to do. Yeah. Well, that's a good-looking meal. Yeah. Uh, Stout-looking meal. I mean, could, could you even buy a new meal if you wanted to? I mean, who would make that? You know, it might be uh, a modified uh, sugar meal that they would have. You buy it down south somewhere. And I think when Donnie Likens was dealing with it, he went down south and bought, I guess it was a sugar meal, you know, what they made, uh, sugar cane. Uh, I know he brought one back one time, and uh, he had a little uh, S10 pickup. He <laughs> saw that little pickup do to haul that mill. Yeah. It was about a number three or number four big mill. What number mill is that? I believe it's a three. Three? I'm not sure, yeah. So the, the lower the number, the bigger the mill? Yeah, I think that's the way it works. <clears throat> yeah, that one looks like it's got some weight to it. That thing would probably weigh at least uh, 2,500 pounds. I wouldn't doubt it a bit. Yeah. yeah. It's got three cylinders in there, it turns, you know. Okay. Uh, yeah, today, what, it probably about 60 degrees out here, Something I guess. Something like that, and, yeah. Yeah, I see it. Maybe one y'all yeah. jacket there, but you, I guess those get bad in hot weather. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they'll eat you up and, yeah. and when it's really warm. <clears throat> this here's pretty labor-intensive, uh, appears to be, I mean, and the thing about it is uh, you've got to keep enough reserve because... You can't let the pan go dry, right. so once you start, you can't stop it, can you? No, you have to keep it going. Yeah. This is the hardest part, in my estimation, is trying to keep these stalks out here. You know, if you had a conveyor carry them up to put them in a dump truck, this is a dump truck, but we have to load them on, and you can dump them off, yeah. but that's where all the labor is. Uh, you need a small, like a small corn elevator or something, don't you, sitting under yeah. there? But, of course, that takes either another tractor to turn it or a, a yeah. motor or something. Something. Yeah. Uh, but that, that helped a lot, you know, to do that. And, but uh, this is, to me, this is the hardest part right here is fighting these stalks. Yeah. Keep, keeping them out. Sean, that pile's are getting smaller, isn't it?
who who helps you or do you do most of this by yourself? No, uh, Ralph came from there. He helps me a whole lot. And his son, Sean, helps me some. And uh, that's who does the most of it. We do. So uh, let me ask you this question. Some people talk about sorghum. Some people talk about molasses. Is that the same or is it different? In, in this country, it's the same thing. But there is a molasses, it's extract from sugar, but it's put in cow feed originally is what it's for. Right. Comes from down south after they make sugar. It's just, it's just a throwaway product, byproduct of sugar. sugar. It's as black as your coat is. Yeah. Sorghum's not that color. This is really called, sorghum is table syrup. Molasses is not. <laughs> okay. This is originally described in the finer restaurants, they call this table syrup. Table syrup. It's sorghum table syrup. Dad just rolled over. Huh? Dad just rolled over. I know, he hates it, but <laughs> he'll get over. He hates to use the word syrup with syrup. But that is what it is. Uh, just like a maple syrup. So how many varieties of, what variety of cane is this? This, this is Dale. And how many varieties? You don't have enough fingers and toes. Somebody's always got a new variety somewhere, some of them. Uh, uh, down south, they got different varieties than we have because they got a longer growing season. We can't grow them up here and get them to come off before frost. Does it take, uh, is, is high acidity, uh, is that what cane needs to grow in or uh, a lot of phosphate or what kind of soil grows the best cane? Sandy. Sandy. River bottom. River bottom. Now whatever is worse in there, that's fine, but you don't put much, uh, like, 350 pounds of the acre broadcast of like triple 10 is all you put, you don't want a lot, and you don't want much nitrogen on it, it makes it foam too bad. Okay. okay. Well, it's different with each variety too, though. But high nitrogen makes yeah. all of them foam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, another question. How many, what does one gallon of green juice render sorghum? If at about 14% sugar, it'll take between 10 and 12. 10 or 12 gallon of, of juice to make, one to make one gallon of edible sorghum. Does the weather affect it? Like if there's a lot of rain in the season, does that make That's the reason the juice contents are down there. Usually his one runs about 16%. This year we're getting 14 out of it, too much water. It sucks it up. We got, that's what we're doing here, boiling it back off. That's what all the steam is, we're trying to get rid of the water. So a relatively dr dry season produces better sugar. If, better if sugar. Higher, higher sugar content. Higher sugar content, yeah. yeah. And the amount of juice you got. Yeah. From the time that this drips in here, once you get to making it, it's your groove, how long does it take to get that through the pan in the cycle? Is, it, is that in here, probably maybe 30 minutes or that long? No. Or Hour and a half, about the best you oh, can possibly do. From the time I start juice in there before you ever get the first sorghum off. But then after that, it's continuously. Right, as long that's, as you're putting That's right, it's called a continuous evaporator because of the way the panels are set in it. It'll continually keep moving. Now, the old timers, this pan was one solid piece of pan, and they stood here and just kept skimming and skimming and skimming until it got that thick, and then they pulled the far after under it and dipped it out and put it in a jar. They didn't do what we're doing here. Well, they just had one pan. It's solid. On a good day's work, and how many, how much can y'all make? Everybody goes good. It never does. If, we're we're going to say if it went really good, and the wind and everything cooperated, 30, 35 gallons, that, that's, that'd be 10 hours. That's a lot. That would be eight hours of boiling after we got it started coming off. That's about all you can make. You can make, you can make more on wood pans than you can with the guys. Because the wood was a lot hotter, but if we was uh, using wood, you wouldn't be standing right there. Right. Honey, it'd melt your britch legs off from you. <laughs> you just can't, wood's so hot, you can't understand it. You got this sock, or that's a piece of uh, cloth there, that just sort of strains anything that. Yeah. Anything, anything of that strainer up there didn't catch. Yeah. 
you know, that's all that's on our fur is a precaution, you know, to try to catch anything that don't, because most of it will boil out and catch in these right here. That's what they do. You know, they look bad. I wouldn't want to eat them or drink them, but they're just part of the process, the impurities that you boil out, and they'll collect. So this, the sections of this pan, Here's a, here's a divider, here's a divider. So this is a gate here, I guess. You have to lift this up to move this on over, is that right? Well, I'm a holding it there. See, it, it's open. Oh, it is open, okay. I just keep this stuff right here controlled back here out of my way. Okay. More of it to hold it on this side of it. Now this one, it has a rag under it to help us control the depth. Okay. That's what this right here does too. As you can see, it's much deeper here than it is here on this. Right. That's because that's the way we want it to keep it boiling out. Then as it moves up here, it stays about the same. Different colors of it here. This has more water, less water as it goes down to the sorghum. You can even see the colors different in it. Yeah, yeah as, as you say, like making homemade candy at home, you start with it. You know, whatever, but as it starts turning and it starts to look like making peanut brittle or yep. something like that, you know. That's but exactly what that does. Or even like the old fashioned pool candy, you know, that it gets to a certain consistency and starts looking some similar to strips that. Strips and stalks. Yeah, yeah, them strips. Some, and some people does it. Yeah. That's why I said he, he stripped his. What difference does that make? Difference oh, you want to know what the difference is? Uh, it depends on who you ask. But according to the University of Kentucky, they zero. The only difference is, is if you don't strip it, you got a little more starch in it, which that just affects your boiling here. That's what they say. Uh, Labor-wise, you can't afford to strip it if you're trying to make anything. It takes an average of at least 40 hours of experience somebody that's done it to strip one acre. Wow. Welcoming you to another episode from Field to Plate with Larry. Larry Lewis, that's me for those that don't know me. Um, it's, we have took our mid-season break and we're back in action now. Look forward to coming through fall with some cool fall dishes, some wild game dishes. And today's show is actually going to be a pork loin stuffed with wild rice, mushrooms, and cranberries on a bed of thinly sliced baked potatoes, red potatoes, and... Um, Russell sprouts with a special Cajun seasoning crusted on pork loin. Um, what we want to do to get started is with our stuffing. This is a mixture of um, just different mushrooms. I think I got regular white mushrooms and um, por baby portobello mushrooms. If you have morels, you can use it. Um, shiitake, any kind of mushroom is going to be good. Any earthy, any earthly flavored mushrooms. You want about a couple cups, because remember, mushrooms, when they cook, they'll actually, um, actually cook down to nothing. So, um, and you don't want to do a real fine chop or you'll lose that mushroom taste in it. So we're going to slowly add these to our iron skillet and olive oil. Let me turn this down just a hair. And um, we'll get these added into this. This is all going to go in our stuffing. And we're going to set this to a side. We're going to get our Brussels sprouts and stuff ready and set them to a side and then kindly come back and stuff our pork loin. And roughly it takes about 15 minutes to stuff the pork loin. One of my favorite fall dishes is incorporate a mushroom stuffing with cranberries, of course. 
and um, stuffed pork loin, and um, it's it's a it's a really good dish, kind of like earthly, um, rustic, and, and a good dish to serve either your family for dinner or if you have friends come over. And this is a tenderloin, not a pork loin. Um, the difference is when you eat it, you know, because a pork loin is a solid loin off of the chop without the bone in it, the boneless pork loin. And then um, a um, tenderloin is the inside of that that's super tender that you can cut with a fork. So today we're actually using the tenderloin part of it, which is really good. Um, I mean, now I'm going to add about half a cup of cranberries. You don't want a lot of cranberries. Sometimes I chop them, but I want to leave them whole, let them cook down on this one. Um, you can chop them up if you don't like it, you know, if you don't like the big ones. But I want to see that cranberry and stuff, and I want that big chunk of cranberry in that bite. So um, that'd be plenty of cranberries. Um, cranberries can be tart sometimes. Excuse me a second while I get a spatula so I can turn this. Um, and the reason why we're cooking all this down, we want it pre-cooked, putting the stuff in, because it's not going to take long for our um, pork loin or tenderloin to cook. So we don't want to overcook everything, so we're going to pre-cook some of this. Now we want to add an onion to it. Um, this is large onion, so we're only going to add possibly about a third of it by the time we trim it up, maybe a little less than that. The recipe, of course, will be posted when we do this episode on MTTV on the website where the recipes and shows are posted. So tune in to that area of the website to um, find all of our recipes. And also, um, you can find cooking shows of past on it. So um, for those that didn't know that. I like to rough cut kind of everything that goes in this dressing because it is rustic. Um, onions, it's a white onion. You can use a Vidalia sweet onion. I wouldn't use a yellow onion for this. Um, they can be a little stronger sometimes. And if you don't like onion, you don't have to add as much. Um, I personally like onions, so um, about a quarter of a cup, probably half of a cup of onion. We'll add about a quarter of a cup to it. And remember, this is going to be spread in with our wild rice that we're getting ready to take out in a little bit and add to it. So when we come back from break, we'll add our wild rice, set it to the side, and we'll get started on our potatoes and Brussels sprouts cooking. Okay, as you can see, I've added the different mixture of rice, wild grain, white. It's just a mixture, I think, five different rices. Um, you can use any kind of rice you'd like. I like this mixture because it gives a different texture and combination of flavors. Um, this is actually going to be our stuffing for the pork. We probably won't hardly need this much, so you can, um, a lot of times I'll put it around the pork after I do it, just kind of bed it in it and you can have it for the side. You can tell our cranberries are kind of like soft now because I can take my spatula and actually crush them into it and they're really soft. Um, I do that, it lets the flavor out of them. So this is coming together now. We're actually going to um, take this off and put it in our bowl to the side. Um, just let it be rest and cooling off where we can handle it in a little bit and actually put our um, stuffing in our pork or, or um, tenderloins when we slice them open. Because um, you don't want to stick your hand in there right now. It would be super hot. I can remember this time last year, we actually didn't get to do a show on it, but we did an old fashioned hog killing and we filmed a little bit of it, but it reminds me of a day because it's actually almost a year that we're actually using pork loin also. And um, when we tie all this together after a while, we'll actually be putting a um, sorghum glaze, which is actually equal parts of sorghum, mustard, um, a little brown sugar, and a little apple cider vinegar. You only use about a uh, eighth of a cup, something apple cider vinegar, just a little bit. And um, that glaze actually help with your cranberries and that tartness and all that. So we're gonna set this to the side, um, actually set it to the end, and I added a little olive oil. Don't get a new skillet for this. There's no use dirtying another skillet. 
Um, same skillet, use it for your potatoes and Brussels sprouts. Not going to put a tremendous amount of flavor on these. Um, they're not going to need it. I slice them thin, about eighth, quarter inch, whatever you prefer. Um, the shavings on them is fine like that. If they fall off, they'll just get crispy and they'll be great. They've been pre-washed, so I did wash them. And um, I don't know if you all like Brussels sprouts. A lot of people compare them to the mini cabbage, and I kind of think that's correct. We eat them a lot at the house. Um, several good ways to prepare Brussels sprouts. A lot of times I'll just um, slice them, brown them up really good in an iron skillet in a... Um, oven and put parmesan cheese and garlic on them is a really great combination today we're going to use a little bit of garlic and um, paprika and different seasoning on it that i already got mixed with some rosemary um, it's a good seasoning too it's a homemade seasoning i kind of do it's my take on a cajun italian seasoning of and You can also just um, grill Brussels sprouts is a good option. When I do that, I'll cut them in half and I got a grill pan that I use for that. Um, and then I'll toss them in olive oil and just grill them in the grill pan with holes in it. And that way you don't have to worry about your Brussels sprouts falling down through the um, grill into the bottom of it. My pan is smoking hot and that's what I'm wanting right now. And this is sizzle, make some smoke, a little bit of smoke, but you want to brown these Brussels sprouts. You want to take your potatoes, cut the ends of them off. Um, you want to slice them kind of like semi-thin too, same, same thickness. And it don't matter if you cut them this way or the cross the other way, just get them all in a good thin slice like that. This is kind of like, if you notice on my shows, I do a one pot dish most of the time. Um, that's, I never really ever meant to do that, but I guess that's one of the style of cooking I have that um, I don't like to do dishes. I'm not going to lie. Um, Julie, my wife, most of the time I cook, she does the dishes. It's a pretty equal trade. She likes it too, which my wife can cook really well. So um, I try to limit when I cook and make dishes. It's looks pretty that's um, in one pot and um, and you know you can eat it like that and it all goes together so you'll see out of my cooking a lot of times that's what I do and you know a long time ago that's used to, used to be how they cook you know they cook for a crowd and they'd put all the ingredients together make it work and you know, have a meal in one pot, one pot meal. Maybe that's where the term come from. And if you notice, I do have a new jacket day, and it's not because I'm a chef. I just thought it looked cool. So I'm far from a chef. I'm just a good old country boy who likes to cook, and I've been blessed with being able to do this, be on this show. So we're gonna turn our skillet up a little bit. Cut one more potato and put a few Brussels sprouts in it. And um, we'll add these potatoes. And what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna brown um, all the potatoes and Brussels sprouts a little bit. I'm not gonna cook them completely through because it's gonna bake in the oven for about another 20 minutes. But I do wanna get them cooked three quarters of the way through, half to three quarters. Um, so we'll finish cutting the potatoes, Brussels sprouts, putting them in here. And when we come back, we'll actually be stuffing the pork or the tenderloins with the stuffing, um, fixing or prepping our dish, putting the oven, and we'll have everything in there baking. So here on the show, we got these really nice pork tenderloins, um, all natural, free range. Actually, they are free range, all natural pork loin, no antibiotics, no steroids, all that. Um, so I want to stuff them and you can, 
there are a couple of different ways you can kind of do it. You can kind of take a thinner and kind of roll them out like this if you want to. If I don't cut through it, I've done that before too. And um, make you a pocket like that. And, or you can just cut right down the center like that and do a deep pocket. Um, I prefer this method. And I'm going to continue this one that way. So, but you can do it either way. Um, you can make a pocket any way you want to. Only difference is if you thin it out all the way around, it cooks a little, cooks a little better. So we can actually finish that one like that. And um, and there are a couple ways. If you want to, you can take a meat mallet and actually thin them really down and wrap them really tight and have thinner cuts. But I don't like doing that because that tends to let it dry out quicker and I don't want a dried pork loin, um, tenderloin. Take a little bit of my seasoning, season the inside of it. This is cayenne pepper, rosemary, um, a little Cajun seasoning I mix in with it, um, paprika, and just a little bit, of, a very little bit of brown sugar for some sweetness to it. So um, just a little bit on the inside. And the stuffing is actually um, what we came up with earlier. And yes, I'll use my hands for this. Um, it's the wild rice, cranberries, mushrooms, onions, and um, that mixture. So you want to get a good portion of it in here like this on both of them. And it's going to squeeze out and it's going to fall out and all that good stuff. So don't worry about that. we got plenty. We'll stuff them and um, stuff them up. And see, you can put quite a bit on it, so I'm going to stuff it pretty full. And when we put in pan, transfer the other. Like I said, they're going to be, it's going to fall out. Don't be alarmed. It's fine. We're actually going to have some extra um, that we'll put in, in with the food when we bake it. So um, that's fine. So now we actually want to turn our pan back up and get it smoking hot, which won't take a second because I had it smoking hot a minute ago. If you want to, you can get butcher twine and you can tie these up or you can take you a couple toothpicks or you can just lay it in there on the side and flip it each way. I mean, it's most of the stuff is going to stay in. Sometimes I do take butcher twine and I'll tie it to where it stays together, but it's, it's not necessarily. And um, so we'll actually do both of them. We're just going to fold it over. That's probably got a little too much on the end here. You can take skewers, put in it, whichever way you want to do it. And we're actually going to, um, this is just going to brown each side of it a little bit. Is what we're going to do with this one. Kind of fold it over like that and let the meat set. Same way with this one. We'll just turn it over. That way keep the stuffing in it. Um, it pretty much all of it's going to stay in it, so it ain't no big deal. I have a bigger cast iron skill I could use, but I'm using this one today. Now what we're going to do, we're going to brown it on each side. And then we're going to transfer it after a break into our bacon into our skillet in the oven, which is already preheated 450 and finish it off. And when we come back from break, we'll show you how, how that looks and what we're gonna do with that. So I uh, took our main pan out that's gonna be plated, in, which has our Brussels sprouts and potatoes. They're three quarters cooked right now. Um, actually, want, we want them to brown, so that's why we want the extended time with pork loin. If you can see on the pork loin, one side browned up really nice and that's what you're looking for. The other side is brown. We're getting ready to transfer our pork loin along with our stuff into this pan. And then we're gonna let it cook approximately 20 minutes in the oven, check it, make sure it's done. When it gets done, it'll be good to go. Um, so this is the fun part. And you can see right now, most of your stuff is in there. Um, you can put your butcher twine in there and tighten them up. Like I said, that's a, that's a really good option. Um, but I don't see the need for it on this application. Um, put both your pork loins in there. And then I take the remaining stuffing, which comes out. And you can either open them back up and 
put it back in there like that with your spatula, which is a good idea. Um, on that one, so that one's good. Close it back over. And just brush it in there, be fine. And that one's still pretty full. And you can actually just dump your um, stuffing out on there, like that. And then what we'll do, we'll actually um, put this in the oven, like I said, 20, 25 minutes to pork's cooked through. The, our potatoes, Brussels sprouts will be browned. When we come back, we'll slice our pork loin with the stuffing and actually be sitting on the Brussels sprouts and potatoes. Um, to this, we made a sorghum glaze. And this is super simple to make. I made it during our um, weekend at Sorghum Festival for pork loins, ain't no secret. Um, if you're making a big batch of it, use a quart jar, a cup of mustard, a half a cup of um, apple cider vinegar, and about a cup of brown sugar, mix it together, and it makes a really good gla glaze um, anyone can use. We want to use this for two, two aspects. We're going to put a little bit on now, and you just want to kind of let it glaze over it like that. And we're actually put a little bit on it when we get it done. And this actually helped with the tartness of the cranberries and some of the other flavors that's kind of in there. Um, and they'll actually glaze on there really well, like that. And that's pretty much it. We're going to put this in the oven. We'll be back in a little bit to plate this dish up. So welcome back. We're ready to plate up. Our pork loin's roughly been in there around 20 minutes. It's done. Um, one thing about pork loin, especially tenderloin, it's really easy to overcook. If it overcook, it's going to dry out. Technically, the done for pork loin is 145. I usually get it up to 150, 155 um, preference. Um, so let's get this out. It's extremely hot. Um, so we to plate it up, I'll get the pork loin out. And then if you can see, I don't know if you can see this, but our um, sorghum glaze actually run down on our Brussels sprouts and our potatoes. So to plate this up, I would do me a layer of Brussels sprouts and potatoes like this. I like to use wood planks to plate. It keeps it a little rustic looking. Um, let's get over here and get some of the chard because I like my Brussels sprouts to be a little, a little char in them too. You can see the cranberries, everything cooked nicely with it. A little bit of stuffing in there also where it leaked out a little bit. That's normal mushrooms and stuff so that's our bed that we're going to lay it on and if you can see our pork loin still got all the stuffing inside of it i slice it across like this you can see it's perfectly cooked or it's perfectly cooked for me it's extremely hot so You can see the cranberry and the stuffing that's in there. So we'll actually want to um, try to keep it together. You can four pieces like that. And you want to plate it right on top. And um, that's our dish. So if you um, take a look at that, that's how I'd plate it. You can see our stuffing in it, our Brussels sprouts, mushrooms, some stuffing around it. And you can eat this just as a meal. A complete meal just like that. Thanks for tuning in on this episode from Field to Plate. Hope you enjoy this dish. I um, want to thank MTTV for allowing me to do this show. Look forward to um, you guys watching it and also get on the website and look up these recipes and we also have a lot of old episode shows of In the Kitchen with David Bradley and my show and some other shows that's on, listed on there. So go and check that out. You'll be, um, you'll really like it. Hopefully learn to cook some new dishes. And um, until next time, thanks for tuning in from Field to Plate with Larry Lewis.